I'm Julia Gillard, and this is a podcast of one's own. I'm offended by the lack of women in positions of leadership and the way those that do make it are treated. Today, I help lead the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London, headquartered in the Virginia Woolf Building. In 1929, Virginia said she aspired for women authors to have the space to write in a room of one's own. Here, I want women leaders to have a podcast of one's own. I have a very special guest in my digital lockdown studio today. I'm not going to introduce her in my own words, but in the words of some of the world's most legendary actors. Nicole Kidman called her the Queen of Australia. Brad Pitt called her exquisite, mesmerising and otherworldly. Meryl Streep described her as gifted, talented and brave. George Clooney called her the best actor working today and even suggested he was intimidated by her. I want to welcome and thank Kate Blanchett for joining me today. Kate, we're having this discussion during the world of COVID-19 restrictions and I wanted to start by asking you how that's impacting your industry. It seems almost impossible to imagine now all of us being able to go back into a crowded theatre to watch a play or go to the movies. So what's it meaning, do you think, for the future of film and theatre? My industry is a very human industry. I mean, I, I started my career and really, as you know, the Australian film industry is incredibly potent, but it's a small industry in relation to, say, China or India or the US. So I had never had any designs to work in that in that area. And when you think about film, you think about it being at once removed from an audience. And particularly in the in the wake of the streaming revolution, we've in recent years considered our viewing time, our gathering time in our home. But I think when we emerge from this, that people are going to want to gather because it's a, it is a human drive to gather together in public and experience story. And we're all going to have our own personal stories to tell. We're going to want to find that sort of connective tissue that, that gathering together in artistic spaces provides for us. It's a, a very basic drive. So whilst it might seem in the short term it's very challenging for us because obviously production has been stopped, people can't go into the theatre and, you know, the arts in Australia in particular are in a very, very precarious position and, I, um, and you know, and I'm very engaged in, in what that's going to mean for the industry, the very, very important industry to Australia, you know, as we re-emerge from lockdown. But I, I do think people are going to want to stop seeing one another in tiny little boxes in Zoom meetings and they're going to want to breathe the same air. So I think all bring back the drive-in. I mean, that's a huge memory from my <laughs> childhood, you know, gathering, putting down the, you know, in your own little family pod and watching something large on, on a big screen and eating popcorn and, and, you know, homemade nachos from home in the back of your car. But you're gathering and doing that like you do in a cinema with other people that you don't know. We complete the, the circle as an audience. And I feel that absolutely on, on stage is that it's, it's the audience who gives the thing meaning. And it's gathering with strangers to find that collective meaning that I think art is a, it's a you know, cinema, a theatre, you know, going to a gallery. That's what um, connects us all. And so I think it's going to be very important as we re-emerge, actually. There could be a renaissance, really, for the, what it means to and the way we, we tell in stories and the way we consume them, I think. You heard it here first, the drive-ins coming back. How fantastic <laughs> would that be? <laughs> and, Kate... Personally, what's it meant for you? You're all fine in this period? I'm, I'm fine. I had a bit of a chainsaw accident yesterday, which sounds very, very exciting, but it wasn't. But no, no apart from the little nick to my head, um, we're fine. I, I'd taken the year off being a working mother of four. My eldest son was doing his A-levels. And of course, I, so I took the year off ostensibly to, to be with him and support him through that exam period. And then all of that exam stuff evaporated. And of course, I'm left with an 18 year old who doesn't really want to have anything to do with me. So it's a little bit discombobulating. But, um, you know, look, it's a, it's a high class problem. We're all, we're all well. And, and so I found myself being a kindergarten teacher to, to my five year old, which is just as challenging. I think I'm, I have a huge respect for the teaching profession. I always have, you know, you look at countries like Finland 
and their educational outcomes, which you would know far more firsthand than I than I would. But they're, they're so great because teachers are paid the same as lawyers and doctors. It's a it's a much respected profession. I hope out of this that uh, teachers' wages will be increased and their, and their respect will be, um, you know, amplified by COVID-19. I'm certainly getting texts from friends who are struggling with homeschooling who are suggesting that teachers should be paid a lot more. Now they've got more of a sense about how difficult it is. But be very careful with that chainsaw. You've got a very famous head. I don't think people want to see any nicks taken out of it. I know, I want to keep it on my shoulders. (laughs) I'm going to take you, Kate, back to the very beginning. You were born in Melbourne in 1969, the middle child in a family of three with an American father and an Aussie mother, when was the first moment that you would have said to yourself, hmm, I reckon girls get treated differently to boys? Gosh, you know, I don't ever think about my gender. I still don't until a door is shut to me because of it. And I grew up, you know, my, my father died when I was 10 and my mother had to go back to work for economic reasons. I, I grew up with my grandmother in the household. And so it was a very strong female household. And I got to high school, to an all girls college. My mum worked really hard. She wanted me to have a, you know, a, a, all of us to have a good education, my brother included. The motto of the school, even though it was a very, very feminist school, was for God and for home. And my mother railed against this, saying it's, you know, of course, the the school was incredibly feminist and they, like, they didn't even do plays with boys because they wanted girls to have, they thought that most drama that was available to girls, most of the good parts were for boys. So I played men all throughout my my high school. But my mum railed against this motto. And at the same time, she didn't identify as being feminist. And I found that very strange because I always thought the foundations of feminism were in equality and I didn't see what was so wrong with boys being equal to girls. I felt physically capable, intellectually capable, creatively as capable and I grew up amidst the backlash that came out of second wave feminism and so this I've just done a a piece about the Equal Rights Amendment in America and that was really rounding the circle for me because it really helped me to understand why what I would see to be my feminist mother, couldn't identify as being a feminist. So it was quite conflicted. I think not not necessarily the drive, you know, of the women can do anything, but more about the language around my upbringing, about what were qualities that women should feel they they deserve and, and what, how women describe themselves, I think, was, was quite, it was quite a maelstrom, I think, in the 80s. And would you have used the word feminist yourself or because it was the days of the backlash and we do know every feminist wave comes with the pushback, would you have shied away from that word too? No, I I didn't because I I did, you know, in my very kind of adolescent way, my reading around what it meant and and that I, I didn't understand that there was any separation between being a woman and being a feminist because I didn't see that my my drive to self actualize was in any way denuding my my brothers in arms their right to self actualize so i i felt that i claimed that space and what was distressing to me or confusing to me was i wasn't having these arguments with men or boys i was having them with other girls and so i felt that somehow the language around feminism was driving a wedge between girls and women do you know what I mean? So I found that very, yes. I found that very distressing, and and in in a way, it's only been in the last two or three years that I felt that those trenches that have been getting deeper and more divisive since the eighties have started to narrow, and that women have been diving into those trenches together much more. I think it will certainly in my experience. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think we can get caught up on the language and not see the solidarity and the substance. And yeah. I do feel like some of the barriers that used to be there, some of the stereotyping about, you know, stay at home mums versus working women and all the rest of it, that that's fallen away a lot, fortunately, to allow mm. people to see that there are common challenges but also, to your point, I mean, I think that all of these issues were something that women had to solve by themselves. Everything around the, the family were purely f- female concerns. And so Phyllis Schlafly, who I've just 
pl played absolutely saw that women were the foundations, the moral upholders of, of, you know, the moral flag of society. And it was up to them to solve the, the family problems. And if you, if women were, were asked to enter the workforce, that somehow the family unit would fall apart. And whilst I think that that's an impossible burden for women to bear, I also think it shuts men out of a whole range of responsibilities and pleasures that result from taking on those responsibilities. So I, I always thought that feminism was a way of kind of opening up and having a more responsive, reactive, forward-moving, pro truly progressive society. It was, yeah, it's, it's a very confusing thing, language. You know, we think we're very visual as a culture, but, but we're actually, words mean a lot, as you know. <laughs> Tell us about Phyllis and the miniseries because uh, many people listening probably don't know the story. No, well, I didn't know anything about her. You probably knew far more about her than I, I did. I, I couldn't even say her name. But she was, the, the, the series, but it's, a, it's called Mrs America and it, it basically deals with the drive to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, to put it into the American Constitution. Now, my father was American. I thought I knew, you know, I'm, Amer I'm an American citizen. I'm a, a dual national. I thought I knew, you know, a modicum about the um, American constitution. But, and so I had assumed that equality would have been foundational in, into what is seen to be one of the great Western democracies. And so it was a shock to me that the notion of equality was politicised and that, that Phyllis, who was a conservative mother's, mother of six from Alton, Illinois, helped to prevent it being ratified. So it, equality is, isn't actually in the, in the American constitution. And I think she believed by stopping it, she was protecting women from having a feminist agenda that they didn't agree with imposed upon them against their will, which I really, really was curious to delve into because anyone who works their entire life to prevent equality being achieved, I really want to know why. And is it hard to think yourself into a role like that? I mean, I don't know anything about your craft and, and never will, but it would seem to me that the further away the value system is from your own, the harder it might be to get yourself in that character and that space. Yes. I mean, for, for me, that's that's the challenge, isn't it? I mean, it's to... You don't have to be a murderer to play a murderer. You know, I played mothers before I was a mother. It's always an act of empathy to try and place yourself in somebody else's shoes without judgment because I do respect an audience and I see my job as presenting, first and foremost, a piece of entertainment, but in this instance, one that, that is going to provoke, hopefully, points of connections across party political lines and, and ask people to invite them to ask a lot of questions. So I do that myself. I ask those, I try and put the, the character on the couch and try and work out what makes them tick. But yes, it was a huge challenge because I think she still is, even after her death, a very, very controversial and polarising figure because everything she did in her life would seem to place her neatly in the, in the feminist camp. She spent her life travelling around the country, had a, a very strong political bent and, and I think probably would have hoped to have had a place either as an advisor or Minister of Defence, Secretary of Defence in, in Reagan's cabinet. But she didn't identify as being that. And in fact, she spoke very negatively about the drive, the central drive of, of the feminist, second wave feminist, to, to make women equal to men. Not the same, but equal. So it was a challenge, a big challenge. Sounds intriguing. We'll all have to watch it. I can't wait. And, <laughs> and we've got more time now than we used to to uh, yes, watch yes. things at home. Yes. You've famously played men on stage you've, and in film. You talked about doing that at high school, but you've played uh, Richard II on stage. You've played Bob Dylan. In a world where we talk now so much about the social construction of gender. Were you kind of onto that early? Did you in part want to play those roles because you didn't want to feel that there was only a binary choice and that you, Kate Blanchett, could only ever play a woman? You know, as I said, I don't, I don't think about my gender until it, it narrows my opportunity. And so it, it, was a, it was a much more selfish investigation that I just... I get very bored with myself and so as I'm sure millions of other people do but I so I I crave sort of difference and often I would take the so-called girlfriend role 
and because that was what was being offered to me early on and try and do something interesting with it, with trying to positively dive into that old adage that there's no small parts, only small actors. But I, you know, I've been offered to play Hamlet a couple of times and Lear. And I, you'd have to ask, what are you doing to that play by placing yourself as a female presence, even if you play it as a man or as someone who is genderless? Because in a way, Lear, it's about patriarchy and it's about fathers and daughters, which is a very different relationship to mothers and daughters. And so therefore, if you played Hamlet, You'd have to be really, really very, very intelligent, I think, about the way you dealt with the relationship with Ophelia. What does that mean? You know, a same-sex relationship breaks the play open in a very different way. And so how do you, I'm trying to be more forward-looking and how do we, from now into the future, write those extraordinary parts for women rather than going back and and, um, reinventing the wheel with what we already have? Even though, you know, say for Hamlet is one of the the, um, the greatest plays ever ever written, and the chance to to dive into that language is something that I would have relished. Well, I'm going to take you now to uh, thinking about your industry and what's changed in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've been acting uh, for almost thirty years now. Oh dear, <laughs> God, um, time to stop. Um, uh, no, absolutely not. But you mentioned in that last answer the question of women's stories, really, and where does the industry want to go? What kind of stories does it want to bring to people? How do you see the evolution of your industry around its preparedness to tell women's stories? Do you think there's more of an open door now or does it still need a fair old shove? Well, I I think women have always been making work you know, whether they are visual artists or filmmakers or writers, it's just that their audience has been considered niche. And so I think it's, and this is one wonderful thing about this, the the various different ways one can view work now is that there's, there seems to be much more perforation into that assumption that, that, that women only make stories for other women, that they can't speak to the human experience. For me, I think it's been wonderful to see women younger than me having an enormous knowledge now of of the back catalogue of women active in in cinema. You know, going back and say, for example, looking at all of Claire Denis' work, you know, a a filmmaker who who I wasn't alive to 15 years ago. I think it's, it's also understanding the history so that we can move on in a owning that history and that it's human history. It's not just the history of, of women. Or the history of great men, which is how it has been told <laughs> or often yes. told. Or that somehow men can speak for everyone, but women can only speak to a small qu- quotient of society. You know, because I, I do think that, that part of the problem in this, you know, and this is what I've been thinking about a lot coming out of Mrs. America, is that the foundations of feminism, they really are inequality. It's not in domination. But the problem with equality, and maybe this is something that Phyllis Schlafly innately understood, is that the drive to, to reach an, an equal platform so that women can, women's stories can be seen as, as, as they should of equal interest as the stories that men choose to tell is that those men who have 75% of that platform traditionally, they have to give up and share, share that stage. Now, that in the first instance is quite a shocking thing for a lot of people who've never been asked to share before. But what it does do, and I have noticed in writers' rooms, for example, and us without even trying coming up with a list of 60 extraordinary female directors. You know, we had an all-female directing team with one man on Mrs America, is that it changes the nature of the work. So when men start to share, they start to ask different questions. And so their work becomes different. I think it's a much more expansive way for everybody to work. And so what seems like a sacrifice, it's like, it's like the language around climate change. It's always about sacrifice rather than opportunity. And I think equality provides an incredible opportunity creatively, but for all, you know, in all industries. And a man involved in that process, would he feel it to be different? Would he walk away from it changed? Would he take that with him into the next writer's room? Well, I don't know. I mean, women are not a monolithic lump and neither are men. And so therefore, I always deal with people as human beings first and foremost, rather than, you know, saying men would react this way. the, The men that I have been working with have been incredible partners and excited by the change. And, and frankly, the, 
it's just a more buoyant, surprising environment. And I think when you have a hom homogenous set of voices in any creative endeavour, the result will be less than banal because n nothing surprising will have come out of it. I mean, the great rehearsal rooms are one where people are pushed off their centre slightly and into places and territories that they didn't expect themselves to be pushed. And that's how you grow as an artist. And so I think, you know, that's why everyone talked at coming out of Me Too and, uh, you know, the, the, the drive of in Time's Up to actually change the nature of our industry. Because we're a very pointy industry, a very public industry, but because we're a creative industry, we will die as an industry unless we make those changes. And it's upon us to make them, to encourage other people and other industries to make those changes and can see that, you know, we can already see the positive results. Just look at all of the diverse stories that you wouldn't have seen even six, seven years ago that are, that are coming out of the changes that have been made by the racial diversity, the gender diversity, and also the generational diversity, because that's something that's super, super important, you know, is that when you have cross-generational conversations, then I think that's, you know, younger generations can understand the history of, of the industries that they're working in and therefore ask more informed questions about where they want to go in the future. It's diversity is the way to go. I need to get T-shirts printed. <laughs> <laughs> and I think many people listening to this would think to themselves about me too, is it still continuing to change the industry? And is that change then speaking into other areas of work? It does seem in some ways like there was huge attention and inevitably, you know, it's moved on a bit. And of course, there are other big issues in our world to talk about, including uh, the pandemic, which is keeping us apart from each other. Do you think the industry is still learning the lessons and taking Me Too and Time's Up seriously? Well, it's interesting you mentioned the pandemic because I think what is coming out of the pandem pandemic, and this is not just in Western countries but around the world, is that it's revealing base inequalities that are, that are in society. And I think Me Too was speaking to a certain strand of inequality, but the pandemic is talking about inequality generally. And I think that inequality has been a, a growing force for example, in America since the 1970s, not just between the sexes, but between the races and the haves and have-nots, between the native-born and the immigrants, between citizens and leaders and those who are considered powerful and those who don't have agency. And so I think that it's important, really, really important, not just for women, but I think for anyone who's a citizen of a democracy to realise that those things are fragile and that equality and democracy are hard fought and need to be defended. And that unfortunately, I do think they need to stay on the political agenda because it's so easy to slip back into iniquity. And so I, I think it, even the media has an enormous role to play in not speaking to the, the kind of the, the obvious facile end of any movement, but to, to keep the base drives of those movements seeking genuine change, to keep them alive. You know, I, ho I hope that happens, but it's up to all of us to to take up that mantle and to, to realise it's our responsibility living, living in a democracy to make sure that if we see inequality, then we, you know, that we call it out and that it's in our interest to do so. You mentioned cross-generational conversations and I want to talk to you about that in terms of the casting and telling of women's stories. You've commented yourself on the pressures on appearance on women in your industry, the need to look perfect, the Botox and all the rest of it. You said, I look at people sort of entombing themselves and all you see is their little pinholes of terror. And you <laughs> think, just live your life. Death is not going to be easier just because your face can't move. <laughs> and you've also talked about actress years being like dog years. Do you see any of that pressure changing, that we're more prepared to flick on our screens and see women of every age and women who look like they are of every age rather than needing to look 10, 15, 20, 30 years younger than their natural selves? Yes, and look, it's, it's not just in my industry. As I said, it's the pointy end, it's the public face of, of, of that kind of collective terror. And it's not just women doing that as well it's it's from the whole selfie culture and that black mirror quality that the phone phone has it stops us listening it stops us progressing and deepening our you know our conversations with with one another but I, I do think that there's there's been a change 
I think that people have been sick of not having a, a range of stories or not being able to have enough elbow room to, to expand the sense of what's in, what's possible. And that is part of the stories that we, we tell ourselves as, as, as cultures. And every country has its base story that it tells itself, which you have to be aware of. And I think the American story is very different to the story that, say, Australians tell themselves or that Britons tell themselves. And, and that that's not just about being female. And it's not just about our looks, it's about how we feel on the inside. And often, you know, the, the surf, when we deal only with the surface, it's, it's an avoidance of going deeper. But look, I, I do think that people of all shapes and sizes and different ethnicities are, are getting a, a bigger platform. But it's important that it's not seen as being a fashionable blip, that that is integrated so that we don't have to be having this conversation in 10 years' time, that we're having a different, more deeper, richer conversation. And are you optimistic about that? I am. I, I am. When I, when I look at my son's generation, my son who's about to go off to film school, you know, he's 18, you know, he, in a way he's looking at me saying, why, why do you keep talking about the, say, the, the US presidential race recently? The notion of equality and, and the quality of opportunity is so ingrained in him that he sort of feels I'm being a bit flag-waving about female participation in politics because he just assumes that that's that ever that, that women are the same as men and so I, I in a way I get buoyed up by that I do see that there's a lot of hope but also the world as we know is incredibly polarized so you know you can feel like it's all we're all progressing and deepening as a, as a species and then you move out of your own little bubble and you realize that that's not on everyone's agenda it's not on everyone's radar and you've been prepared to put your name and work on some of those very polarised issues, climate change you've campaigned on, and you've also campaigned on the plight of refugees, including as a mm. global ambassador for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. What motivates you to do that? I mean, it could be viewed as quite a risky thing to do for someone whose you know, public profile is about being fantastic at what they do, at being an actor, but you might be polarising your audience by taking a stand on issues that are divisive. It's never my aim to tell people what to think. But the whole, no, the whole idea behind being a goodwill ambassador is to go in the field with UNHCR and to, to bring back those very human stories, to, to try and humanise the, the statistics which are overwhelming for people and to try and find pathways through sharing those stories to allow people in their what can seem to be a very small domestic way to, to challenge xenophobic behaviours and actions in their own in their own communities, because it's only when people demand changes that they take place. It's only when they see the mother going across from Syria and to Jordan with nine children whose father, whose husband died of a heart attack and they've, you know, she's had to carry her disabled child across that the berm. That could be me, you know. And so when you, when you allow people those, those points of connection, it's then up to them what they do with it. But I suppose I could use my platform to push a clothing line or I don't know but I yeah maybe if I could sew better <laughs> I might. but it, it just seems to me that it's it's an extension of, of being a I mean it's it's such a maligned phrase but being a storyteller. I find it hard to imagine the kind of courage it takes and um, in some ways courage isn't exactly the word that I'm reaching for but I, I look at your career and you've made courageous choices on the roles that you play and I'm using that word almost in the yes minister sense you know the political <laughs> advisor who rushes into the room and says that's a courageous decision minister <laughs> by which they <laughs> by which they mean that's damn crazy and I'm trying to find a way of telling you that yeah and there's something just perplexing to me about the courage it would take to show so much of yourself even though you were doing it through the medium of playing others is that how you see your your art you know do you have to kind of really you know reach down and and pull it out every time is it a painful process I find it hilarious Julia that you are oh. talking to me about courage you, you, one of the most courageous women in politics, are talking to me about courage, you know, in, in relation to the, the incredible acts of courage on a, on a minute by minute 
the bravery that, that, that you have displayed and, and has been required of you, I mean, mine pales into insignificance. I mean, I think the difference for me, and I'd love to know what you think, the difference between a politician and an actor is that we are allowed to be. It's our job to be wildly inconsistent and provocative. It's we're, we're outside the system, as it were. So it's important to, to fail and to misstep because that's how you, you grow and the, the, pub, the failure is incredibly public. But politicians, it's all about consistency. It's all about thesis. And I think whilst some of the issues that you're talking about that I've stepped into, climate change, I don't know how saving the planet for future generations is a political issue, but it is. And I don't see how being compassionate and um, welcoming to the, the world's most vulnerable, which is what the global displacement crisis is dealing with, I don't know how that's political, but it is. But that arm of my interest, I suppose, is, is slightly political, but I never see my work as being political. Whereas I don't know how, how you, you, I mean, it must be, I mean, Phyllis Schlafly said something, and I don't know if you have the same, the same taste for blood, but she said, if you, you know, it's like a doctor who can't stand the sight of blood, you're in the wrong profession. If you, and if you can't stand controversy, you know, you can't get into politics. Is that true? Oh, I think that's certainly true. Um, and you can't be, you can't be afraid of the, clash of ideas, you know, because good things come out of the clash of ideas. We should, on the biggest, you know, hardest questions of our age, we should be prepared to have, you know, real debates and Mm. uh, sort of spirited go and not view that as impolite or, you know, somehow inappropriate. Mm. But you're right, there is a rigidity about uh, politics that is the exact opposite of what you do there's a consistency that people yes. expect from their politicians and they do mark people down for inconsistencies understandably i know but but it's also not not talking about wild inconsistencies but things do shift and change and something that i do bemoan and i i really relished looking back in the transcripts of in the 70s is there was this there was this um, understanding and relish of public debate, that that was part of the debate big ideas and that that sense of public discourse and the wrestling of different ideas and, and finding with the desire to find a common ground seems to have been, that rug has been pulled out of, from our feet, I think, in, in, in politics often. You know, I mean, that's what a rehearsal room is like. You, you throw everything up in the air and you, you know that you have to enter the same stage and tell the same story. And that's the drive behind it. It's a connective drive. Whereas I think what's happened, and once again, you'd know this much more than I would, but it seems to be a divisive drive, that it, the battle is everything rather than the, the discourse. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think there's a lot of perceived political reward now in endless hyperpartisanship that it's yeah, actually yeah. the the division that most motivates your tribe mm. to continue on the political battlefield rather than reaching an outcome and saying that's settled now and I think that's a whole lot to do with uh, the way the media has changed and what yes. runs and all the rest of it so mm. you're, you're right I think that uh, you know public policy big discourse we always need to have it but we found it quite hard to establish new rhythms for it in this current time. Mm. Mm. Kate, I'm worried we could talk and talk and talk, but I'm going to have to take you now to the kind of questions that I always uh, ask our guests as we uh, conclude these interviews. The first of them is I always put a fact to my guests on this podcast, and your fact is, according to analysis conducted by researchers from Huddersfield University, Wisconsin University and Lancaster University, the wage gap between male and female actors was virtually the same in 1980 as it was in 2015. And even when they control for variables, there's an unexplained gender gap of around $1.1 million or around 25%. Your reaction? Unsurprised. It's, it's hard. If I, if I was working in the banking sector, 
then my discussing my wage would be considered, it would be a little bit offensive because I'm female and a bit sort of aggressive, but it would be expected. But when you talk about financial returns as an actor, you're instantly called um, a, a multi-millionaire celebrity and, and complaining about, about the level of privilege that you have and go, just go off and have a manicure. Suddenly being an actress is, is turned, turned against you. So I'm not complaining about being able to earn a living from something that I'm passionate about. I'm very, for, incredibly fortunate. I'm white, I'm middle class and I'm healthy. But when you, you know that your white, middle class, healthy male counterpart who is putting in as many hours as you are and perhaps doesn't have children, <laughs> so you're doing two jobs, and you, you know, you, at that point you do want to get your two Academy Awards out and go, I thought these were meant to stand for something. <laughs> they certainly do for, for my, my male counter- counterparts who have two of them. And not that I, you know, that's not why I got into, into the industry and I certainly never expected to earn a living from it. I thought I'd go back and finish my, you know, my um, economics degree. But back in 2008, you know, and, um, and to this day, you still have to push to get paid a third of your male co-star. It's a fact. And there's a fragility and an, a healthy insecurity, I think, that you need in relation to your work, that you've, each time you've got to go and prove to yourself and to an audience that you can do it. And so to have to go in and say, I'm worth this, is a little bit contrapunctal to the, the need, the open-heartedness that you need to go and actually make the work. So I suppose that's where I'm grateful that I have an agent. A female agent who who is very passionate about equality. I'm almost sad you've got the agent because I've got this wonderful image in my mind of you there with your two Academy Awards saying for yourself, look, buddy, these aren't bookends, you know, these mean something. (laughs) Well, they are actually bookends. Yeah, but yeah, you wouldn't want to be hit over the head by one. They're they're very, very heavy. Maybe that's what I should say in the email. Very, very heavy Academy Awards. Not too many people in the world get to pick one up, so that's good to know. Now, Kate, what is the worst misogyny you've had to deal with in your career? Oh, gosh, I think I'm living through it right now and it's not directed at me. (laughs) That was part of the reason why I wanted to, to work on a piece that was about the drive to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment because I wanted to know why the majority of women who voted voted for the man who was currently in the Oval Office. So it's and it's not even directed directly at me but it's I think when misogyny takes place it doesn't it it can be directed at someone else in the room but you feel it the ripple effect on everyone is catastrophic and backward leaning and reductive and aggressive and violent but I you know I had I did have an experience when we were running the Sydney Theatre Company where I was asked by I won't say which banking organization was but one of our sponsors to go to a breakfast meeting which I didn't realise took place all the time in the business community, to talk about board diversity. And I was, on, I was the only woman up there and I was the youngest by 150 years. And I, this man who was there to talk about board diversity, how patronising he was, I cannot even describe. And in the end, I had to call him out on it. And I was calling him out on not speaking to me that way as as a woman, therefore, and, but also I was, I was the worst possible person he could encounter. I was female, I was 25 years younger than him, and I was an artist. So I was a triple threat. And so I think it was on that front. I don't know whether it was misogyny or whether it was, a, you know, it was the generation gap or it was, it was just the fact that I was an Australian working in the arts. But that was a pretty toxic breakfast. If you had all the power in the world and you were able to make one decision to change things for women, what would you pick? I, well, can I pick two? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be equal pay for equal work. It has, to, it has to start with that. But also perhaps even more primal with that, it's having the right to decide what happens to your own body. It's reproductive freedom. And we are still fighting for that right around the world. Good picks, both of them. Virginia Woolf says, I detest the masculine point of view. I am bored by his heroism, virtue and honour. I think the best these men can do is not talk about themselves anymore. Kate Blanchett says. (laughs) 
<laughs> I love the male point of view, but when it's the only point of view, it's boring. It's boring for them. It's boring for me. It's boring for everybody. You know, I, I, can, I can imagine my way into the male point of view. I'm, I love Graham Greene. I love Ernest Hemingway. You know, but I, the amount of female writers that, that I feel don't get the same up until recently, you know, I wish those same people who lauded those experiences also would go and read Maggie Nelson and Rachel Cusk, Zadie Smith. I laugh, I sigh, I move on. <laughs> and that, that seems like a fantastic ending for what has been a wonderful discussion. Kate, thank you very much for joining me on a podcast of one's own. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast of one's own with Julia Gillard from the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London. For more information on our work and to sign up to our updates, visit the Global Institute for Women's Leadership website. This podcast has been produced by Lizzie Ellen and James Miller with Kings Online and additional editing by Nick Hilton. If you've liked what you've been listening to, please rate and review us with your preferred podcast provider and come back next time for another episode of A Podcast of One's Own with Julia Gillard. Mm-hmm.